So I'm not sure if there is uh, for future seismology. I have not. No, oh, there is this. Christians and Dalsa. This one covers a great deal of future seismology. And uh, you'll find some very interesting lecture notes uh, on the home page of this fellow, Christians and Dalsa. So, yeah, let's begin. I think I may have some introductory slides which make it. If, for example, something like this you have seen, okay, it gives a very simple uh, listing, but I find it one of the hardest uh, diagram to comprehend, one of the hardest thing to understand, that whole range of stars, forget all this, yeah, just the main sequence, it's somewhat uh, puzzling that you see that the stars involve a whole lot of things, right? Gravitational contraction, material theory, fluid bodies involving pressure, temperature, density, so many things, mass of the object, radius of the object, different kinds of temperatures, luminosity, different kinds of reactions. Yeah? Each of them are anyway burning some um, elements, the fusion is going on, and they emit, right? Sometimes we can uh, red, sometimes we can blue, these are much more luminous objects. Yeah? These are red by coloring somewhat low temperature stars and the But it, it's very curious that everything falls on a single line, right? It's a, a simply parameterized in terms of a single parameter. That means whole broad property of the sun or star in general, or star, any star, is determined by single parameter. That turns out to be after Period of development and something, you find that it is a mass that determines this curve. This property that it is one dimensional in nature, the HR diagram, it goes by the name Mock Russell theorem. So you heard of it, Mock Russell? So this goes by the name Mock Russell theorem, and it's very uh, interesting that you see so many different types of objects, right? They can all be parameterized in terms of single quantity called mass. Yeah, there's a good reason why mass, but we cannot go into that right? We can talk again uh, later. These are various evolutionary tracks that goes to various instability branches. The same stars, then they follow certain evolutionary tracks as they stop burning hydrogen and they start to burn some other elements, say helium and then CNO and all that. Yeah. The stars expand, the giants, the trillions, you see, stars expand, they can go. There are various instability uh, strips through which the star passes, it uh, basically pulsates, it basically swells up, and it's like oscillatory pulsation of the star, those are variable stars, lots of variable. So it's always one wants to start with it, but it's one of Hardest diagram to understand, at least in my view. How the stars form? I had, uh, so I think now these things I have not covered. I mean, somebody must have covered something. It was, uh, just to give you some idea that there is a lens scale involved. I was saying earlier, right? if I uh, move my hand, why would we form stars here? After all, one would argue that this is a compressible gas. To form a star, you have to compress it. Yeah? And in an unstable manner, the compressibility simply increases. For a long time, it was thought that, that gravitational contraction can support um, radiation, and uh, the radiation that we see from the sun and other stars are essentially simply a process of virial theorem or contraction, gravitational contraction. As you contract, you see that half of the energy is lost as a process. That is the whole virial theorem, right? Somebody taught you virial theorem? Yeah. So, virial theorem is one's most powerful theorem. It was used. Extensively, I think one of the first person to use was uh, Zwicky. 
yeah, and uh, came up with dark matter, the idea of dark matter that they exist. In fact, one could say that the neutron stars were discovered before the neutrons were discovered. Uh, these were works of uh, Fitzwicky, who extensively used the uh, bigger here. So that's one of the most important uh, quantity. But I'm assuming that uh, various introductory courses must occur. I will begin with you. That there are certain lens cubes involved with the perturbations in the gas. Perturbation by that one means there's density perturbations. Yeah? There's a uniform uh, medium, interstellar medium, suddenly over a certain lens scale, you put up a density, say plus, meaning suddenly density uh, goes up by little. Yeah? And if the lens scale exceeds this, yeah, then that will become unstable to its collapse. Collapse. Gravity will take over. Uh, the structure or the perturbation will no longer be washed out by the sound waves in the Okay, the sound crossing time over this lens scale is very long compared to the free fall time. Okay, and therefore the contraction begins, and once it takes over, it's an unstable collapse. Now, okay. so that can happen in industrial medium and form an object heating up as you collapse the It's a curious puzzle to subject that as the star radiates, yeah. You would expect the temperature to fall down, right? Doesn't happen that once you assume certain like equation of state and energy, as it starts to contract, it heats up. It's losing its energy, it's radiating, but it's also heating up. So dq by dt is actually negative. So specific heats are negative. So that's uh, so this goes by the way genes here and the genes collapse. So let's forget about it. Now the sun, uh, you must already have seen there's a photo here. And in uh, UV, if you see, it looks very structured. The sun that looks quite boring in one wavelength can look very structured at the same time in other wavelengths. So, not a lot is happening that is not accessible to the naked eye. And therefore, it is important that one observes and studies sun in various wavelengths. It's very important because certain things are happening only at those wavelengths, or one can view the sun only in those wavelengths. That gives also various like X ray, so much of an X ray emission correspond to a plasma of about a million degree. And that's as you must have now heard that the sun, you would expect that as the as you move out of the sun, yeah, you see the sun is simply a plasma of 700 megameter radius. Yeah, radius of the sun is about 700 megameter. And as you go little up on the order of a megameter, couple of megameters above, the temperature you would expect that it drops. It should drop. Yeah. The after all the energy source is somewhere here, it should drop. It doesn't happen that way. There is a hot layer of corona above the sun. The temperature here is about 6,000 Kelvin, 5,000 Kelvin. There is million degree Kelvin. So that's one of the most challenging problems of solar physics. I will quickly come to say these are numbers that we can skip. Some, of course, through its emission controls a lot on the earth in terms of solar irradiance. The light, amount of light that falls on the earth, of course, has a lot of consequences for even the warming here. Like in general. Structure, as you know, there is a radiative core in which the uh, energy that's produced by nuclear fusion travels by radiation. You know that there are uh, how many modes of energy transport? Radiation, convection, convection. Yeah. When it uh, has traveled about 70% of the radius of the sun, in the outer 30%, the radiation uh, is locked with matter. Or in other words, the medium becomes optically thick. In the outer 30 percent, there and the sun is convected, then the mode of energy transport is convection. Okay, anything that you see, the reason I am saying all that is helio seismology or any other interesting things that requires, as you will see, magnetic fields are entirely powered by motions in the plasma. Motions are governed as uh, a mean to transport the energy. In form of convection. Okay. If the sun was not convecting, might many of these things would not even happen, like the magnetic field, sunspots, and stuff like this. Convection is the primary driver 
of seismic modes they are not different from what we heard earlier uh, uh, in terms of the gravity waves for example that is one type of wave sound wave is one another type of wave sun can also support all these types of waves but you need to excite these waves and here we are speaking and exciting these waves by perturbing the medium continuous what is exciting these waves in the sun yeah that is done by uh, convection motions in form of convection they excite waves and that is what lead to this heliocentric modes studying which one can determine the properties inside the sun after all the sun as a as an object is opaque to us right we only see its outer surface yeah and we are talking about the interior structure of the sun how do we know what is the interior structure of the sun how do we know the density distribution density is increasing but why what is the formula for the density decrease or temperature increases as you go more towards center how do we know exact numbers all that is known by the techniques called heliocentric yeah? model so in that context you should see sun simply as a tabla okay tabla or monium that is the way to see the sun okay that the oscillations of the membrane or a guitar string okay these are the fundamental properties of the object these are the normal modes of oscillation sun given its size mass and certain distribution can support only certain types of modes it cannot support arbitrary types of oscillations by looking at those oscillations one can then infer what should be the conditions inside the sun so that you see these waves on the surface you are still looking at the data on the surface only yeah and you are inferring information about the interior of the sun because these are the waves that are traveling all over the sun inside coming back to the solar surface and leaving their imprint the internal structure leaves its imprint on the waves okay just like uh, i don't know if it is done uh, even now have you done this tuning fork experiments to measure the speed of light as well as the speed of sound in the medium yeah so what did you do speed of sound is a property of the medium right you simply had a resonant tuning fork and by that you measure the speed of sound right because the sound will tell us yeah similarly the sun it's a very complicated data. i mean it's like very very complicated you know there are loads of various kinds but simply speaking if i take a string and clamp, clamp it at both ends yeah the wavelengths are already in a classical system they are all classical systems okay quantization is not a quantum concept as the wave numbers are already quantized here it allows the normal modes allow only a fixed number of modes which can be half wave can be this yeah can be this yeah these are the only allowed possibilities of oscillation for this string which is clamped on both sides these are half wave now if in an organ pipe the tuning fork experiment you did the eigen function yeah of the column which is vibrating yeah supports a quarter You see, must have drawn figures like this, right? So it's a quarter wave. Right? So it depends on the boundary condition that what types of discretization of wave number will occur. Here it's lambda by two. Here it's lambda by four. So like that, right? This is an open boundary condition. There is an anti-load. Here is both sides are uh, closed boundary conditions. Sun, what is sun? Sun is somewhere in between. Sun is neither closed nor open. Of course, sun has a surface which is a fluid body. It can have uh, oscillations just like the ocean. Boundary condition is neither closed nor open. Somewhere in between. So there has to be phase factor involved. But we can see that just like there are cavities in this language, one calls it a cavity. A mold is formed in a cavity. wave is something like a propagating wave it goes from one place to another standing wave is non propagating so standing eigen mode which can form by superposing various propagating waves and form in standing eigen mode and that standing standing eigen mode will have frequency and properties corresponding to the dimensions and physical properties of the object okay that is the subject of heliocentric model to infer the interior structure by observing waves On the surface, surface is all the time flickering. Okay, I don't know if I later have 
an uh, image of Jupiter. To observe sun in great detail, we know that the sun almost breathes at about five minutes. Five minute oscillation in the universe. If you take an average oscillation time scale, which you can see of the sun, these are global oscillations. The entire sun just swells up and comes down like that, just like breathing. So it does it in a global mode at time period of about five minutes. Okay, that's uh, called a five minute oscillation of the sun, and that is like a trapped sound waves inside the sun, which lead to the surface oscillating at this time. So how exactly waves behave internally? It's a tough, but a completely good in the game. Based on that, we now know internal structure. Anything that we are talking about the internal structure of the sun, this is the solar surface, this is the solar center. We are, when we are putting exact number, the density goes like this, luminosity goes like this, temperature goes like this. Yeah, This is all known because of the system. If you now go in the solar atmosphere, that is what I was talking about. The temperature drops a little, but then it has a sharp transition to the air. This is a corona chromosphere photosphere. Okay. So, very puzzling problem. In certain wavelengths, if you see the sun, you will find these large loops. Yeah? These are the magnetic, magnetic field. One often tries to say that these are the magnetic field lines. So, yeah, that's very interesting that sun has such. These magnetic field lines are reconnecting, leading to coronal mass ejection, solar flares. These things you heard, right? Solar flares, now. So, they're all happening because of the magnetic field. Now, the natural question to ask where do these magnetic fields come from? So, Dynamo will discuss in my class tomorrow. Okay, that is by Dynamo. But already at this level, one can wonder. Where these magnetic fields come from? Sun is very old, and it's a resistive plasma. If it had the bond with magnetic field, it should have dissipated. What is maintaining? Okay. So that was magnetic field and some internal structure. Now, if you look at the motions inside the sun, some average profile of rotation, you find that the equator here rotates faster compared to the pole. You must have heard. This is also known from heliocyte seismology. Any, any profile that we know beneath this photosphere is all, has all come from um, heliocyte seismology. Okay. So, but red means high frequency. So, as you can see, the sun rotates differentially. It's very interesting. Now, the questions, natural questions to ask go a step. Okay, what produces the magnetic field? What produces the differential rotation? After all, you'd expect that any shear, to maintain a shear, you must inject a lot of energy. Or you should see how you can produce a shear. Yeah, it's not so easy. It's costly in the medium. You try to diffuse the shear also. Your bodies may uh, want to just rotate uniformly. It's less taxing for the body. So, what produces and maintains the shear? There are two separate questions. Role of convection and rotation in transporting the angular momentum. This goes by the name. So these are all uh, turbulent effects. One uh, name is lambda effect. But I'm only highlighting the problems. What are the problems here? These are the observations which trace us, which, which are there for us to see. If you go in the radiative pole here, you see that everything is like a solid body. The omega, it's a single value. At all latitudes, these numbers are latitudes. Yeah, zero latitude rotates faster. Zero is like equator. This is like a pole, right? Only near the surface you can see that there is so much disparity in the rotation uh, profile. As you go much more deeper below the convection zone, you see that everything rotates like a solid body. So again, that gives a hint that this layer, that uh, so-called thirty percent outer layer where there is a convection. In the sun, that must be reason also for the shear production in the sun. Okay, so the same convection, which is there because of the high opacity in the outer layer, that's an H minus opacity. That the radiation is completely locked to the uh, atoms there; it cannot further propagate. So then the 
it has to convey to transport the heat from interior to the outside. That motion has resulted to so much what you call richness. This uh, differential rotation, magnetic field, seismic modes, everything is driven to go by this outer thread So it's very important to note the role. Central theme of all of this is convection. So that is also helio seismic uh, observations. These are uh, And what that's how surprising is why it is differentially rotated. You do expect that it is solid body. So, uh, again, about the sun uh, and its magnetic field, this is just wanted to. Uh, me, I don't really want to say, don't want to, uh, what to say, go into too much of a detail. So, want to take it very slowly. So, today, if you observe the sun, by the way, so these small granules. This, you see, this is convection on the surface. What is the profile of that convection as you go deeper down is not known very well. Okay. But on the surface, you can just observe you just see it from some polar telescope. You can see that just like you boil uh, uh, water, you have this uh, cellular convection pattern, which is just filling the entire surface of the sun. So these are the dark planes. Dark planes are down drops where the matter is going down. These brighter locations are where the matter is coming up, and this is an overturning motion. That's convection, right? So it's just coming up and down. So that's convection. That means that is the scale at which you see the energy on the surface. This is the scale which is much larger than the scale of the convection, where you see a sunspot. Now we know that the sunspots are magnetized concentrations. This is called an umbra, this is called a penumbra, and all these things you know. So, but this is uh, what I want you to appreciate is that this is such a large thing. How do you build such big coherence? When you have motion spreading everything at small length scales. Yeah. Where do you produce such things? Okay. Now you go back to something like 1630, around the time of Galileo. Okay, there was a credit war that who was the first to discover a sunspot. Then they are, and these are, uh, please note uh, that if you look at carefully, you find that there are umbra, penumbra, all drawn by hand. These are all of hand drawing which people like uh, Christoph Schneider and uh, Galileo did for more than a solar cycle. For that 12 years, something religiously they sit and just observe through a telescope and draw the sun on a page. Okay. So this is uh, the reason I'm drawing that. That's the kind of dedication you see. And even before these were, these were recognized as magnetized objects only in 1908. But the spots that they exist were already known in the 1630s or even before. It's a book called Rosa Ulcina. So, those interested in history can look up uh, controversies around these two people. I chose to uh, show from uh, Christoph Schneider, it's not such a famous name, but see, there are a lot of people doing this. And it's a terrific hand drawing, right? And by daily drawing it, they could see that this sunspot here and this sunspot here on the next day, this moved much more compared to this one. And that's how they already had figured out that the sun rotates differentially. The sun is not simply a rotating block, it's uniformly rotating ball of plasma. They already knew that there is a first piece of differential rotation of the sun, came already by looking at these dark pieces. Close to the equator, they were going very fast. Out, as you go uh, further away, they were going very slow. Yeah, and such details, as you see. Yeah, only later, now we know the Zeeman splitting, you take the spectrum, you find that uh, if you uh, put a slit at a magnetic uh, sunspot, you find that these uh, spectral lines uh, show slit splitting, that Zeeman splitting is true. 
magnetic field, central magnetic field. So typically, it's a 700 nanometer radius on uh, one to two or even larger from five kilogram strength magnetic field. It's very large, much larger than the equipoise Why it is surprising is because Ultimately, you are going to produce these magnetic fields by converting energy from the kinetic motions. Concentrated the magnetic field, you can't draw much more typically. You can't draw much more than what it has. Right? But that is the situation here. More than equipartition, the energy density here locally is much larger than the energy density in this. These are the most interesting things because these are the full points of all flares and CME events and how your structured atmosphere of the sun, like all these promises, they are all rooted onto a sunspot only, some sort of a sunspot, or better to call them active agents, which are bipolar and usual properties. Right? Bipolar because, of course, one could see that this is divergent near to your way, so the flux going up should be cancelled by the down. So that's what these. White and black going up and going down. So now these are, I think, a loop later. This is also not suitable for today. This is fairly complicated uh, uh, in uh, magnetic helicity, but that before that we have to introduce an HP. So let's forget it. Yeah, convection, that's how in uh, numerical simulation, that's how convection looks like. Yeah, if you go deeper down. Different different models produce different different kinds of convection. So this is also an unnecessary complication at this stage. So yeah, at the heart of everything is convection, which drives the seismology, these modes, differential rotation, and magnetic field. Okay, these are different reviews you can look up. The reason I'm showing you this, this is the motivation to study say convection. Challenge is any known theory of convection. Of course, we know. Uh, I am supposed to cover convection in the fluid part, but as you see, there is very limited time. Okay, it's a fairly complicated subject. But simply speaking, when you boil the water, the largest eddy that you produce carries the maximum amount of heat outward. That's the message of convection. Your calculation to do to find that, and the largest scale is defined, decided by the thickness of the fluid in your teapot. So, the largest role that you can fit in will transport maximum energy outward. That is the goal, right? You want to take the heat from below and transport it above, which is then lost to in radiation and reaches us. Right? So the convection has simply led to the transport of the radiation and heat. Okay. Which kind of motion dominates the largest radius in a conventional picture? So, that's a conventional picture and that's an object. Almost two orders of magnitude distance. That is what I'm So we don't know exactly what is the nature of convection. It doesn't seem to be transported as we have learned in textbooks. That doesn't seem to apply. Okay. Now let's come to video session slowly. And I will uh, uh, present somewhat biased my own some experiments of video seismology and uh, what did uh, I try to learn from uh, video seismology. Okay. I would say enough. About what is the wave and what is the mode. Take the wave, trap it in a cavity, you get a mode. Okay. Like this. These are various tuning poles, diagram taken from old churches. Okay. So, because the sun is complicated, about 10 million modes are expected. One mode is like one of these. This is single mode. You can fit a lot of mode, right? Like that. Something. The so number of modes that you can fit in a cavity, you can calculate before it is dissipated by other. Because once you are going to higher overtones, you are creating smaller and smaller wavelengths. They will be dissipated by viscosity. So you can come up with some rough estimate of how many number of independent eigen modes can fit in a given cavity. Okay. For the sun, it is expected about 2 to 10 million modes are expected in the sun. About 250,000 have been detected. Okay, all this one can do calculation, it's possible. It's an analytically practical calculation because we have one, it's possible to do a linear theory 
and one can actually just determine the frequency in the spectrum just by hand. In fact, this morning I showed you uh, surface gravity mode, which had dispersion relation, which is g times k, right? Rho 2, you know, that's a dispersion relation we derive very simply, right? The sun shows identical to this. Sun already shows this. That means the linear theory that you do, some, there are places where it applies directly. And that's only one of the modes. So wherever you see the red, it's basically like a red ship going away, that part of the sun is going away. Wherever you see blue, that part is coming towards you. This is only one of those 250,000 reconstructed mode of the oscillation. Right? So the entire sun is going like that, that right? non-radial oscillation. Okay. What are these things? So if so again, then just think of tabla. Okay. You tap it, there are more the, that forms in the uh, um, hollow part of the tabla, and then there is a membrane which feels that iron mode that is established in the tabla, and it will oscillate at that frequency of the iron mode that is there, similarly for the guitar. Right? Now sun is complicated because if I draw the surface of the sun like this, I'm not drawing the whole sun. In guitar or tabla, the cavity length is fixed. In the sun, it is not. It depends on the wavelength itself of perturbation. Now, the sun, sorry, convection, excites or injects the energy at all wavelengths. It's a turbulent process. You have energy injection at whole range of wave numbers, whole range of wavelengths. Pick one. And that wave, suppose it starts from here, just an idealized. Suppose it starts here. Okay. Wave front I can draw as perpendicular to the direction of road. Just I'm trying to show wave uh, wave front. What is the wave front that is going in a medium? Sun is of course the temperature is increasing as you go inside. Right? So if I draw a wave front here. Suppose I'm just exaggerating it. Okay. If I draw the front here, it's the same wave which is trying to enter the sun. Okay. Yeah. Of a given wavelength. Okay. Just think about it. This is once you get this, then the rest is just an extension of it. So one part of the wave front is at a temperature T0, and the other part of the wave front of the same wave is at a temperature T1. Which is greater than P. Okay. Yeah. So the same wave that is going, the two sides of the wave feel, uh, feel the different temperatures. Okay. So now you go back and uh, figure out your phenomenon of total internal reflection. Okay. So the wave has to turn. The wave which was going like that because it is facing such adverse temperature gradient across a wave frame. It turns and goes here. And now this is like a surface. This is not a closed but not an open. It's like a free surface. The wave bounces off from here and it just continues. It just continues like that. Okay. And once it completes here, this depth at which it turns, everything can be worked out. I'm just giving you in principle derivation because I don't want to go into too much math for today's graph. So you can work out this minimum depth. That is one cavity, which will be unique to a given wavelength of perturbation. A smaller wavelength will be trapped like that. Then it sample smaller depths, then go only shallower. The smaller wavelengths go uh, less deep. Longer wavelengths go much deeper. They can even go all the way from the depth to the center of the sun but then it will just turn back and then form like that, constructive interference. So these waves are bouncing off like that. Five minutes is that time scale. Roughly most waves take about five minutes to move from here to here here. And these are the waves which are now superposing, forming constructive interference and forming an eigen mode, which is trapped in a cavity of depth this. In that depth, this is for a given wavelength, vertically, now this is one trapping in horizontal wavelength. In that cavity, now you can fit just like this. Now the cavity depth is decided. Yeah. 
the given horizontal wave number, a cavity is fixed. You can trap at that horizontal wave number multiple z uh, overtones. Okay, so you have to little bit get it right. Okay, take your tabla, make it very complicated. Okay, there is not single cavity, there is multiple cavity. First, you start it from a wave number, which is like a horizontal wave length, just like you look at an ocean and that's a perturbation in horizontal scale. That kind of the wave is also uh, going inside the sun. No, no, so it's sound scale. This is the sound scale, which is going inside. Gravity wave does not travel this. Sound wave is this gravity, surface gravity does. Internal gravity is different kind of wave, which I did not cover. So, you have to, of course, read later a family of three modes in the sun. Yeah? So, because these are sound waves. So, these are the sound waves. But sound waves in a medium like the sun, which is so inhomogeneous, will behave exactly like this. Yeah? So, if you uh, speak at a certain wavelength, it may not reach here. There's another wavelength it may reach. It's a property of the sound wave. So, there are three types of modes, P, F, and G. This is called the pressure mode. This is called the surface gravity mode, GK. This is called the internal gravity waves, G modes. When you look at a cloud and you find some uh, band like structure, those are the G modes. Or when you are going in a flight, and uh, quite often you don't see any cloud, but you experience atmospheric turbulence. You see that the flight is shaking, and there is no cloud nearby. That is a G mode, which travels at an angle. Okay. That is an equal cloud. So that is uh, the kind of thing that exists in the sun. These are family of, oh, I'm uh, going other side of it. Sorry. Yeah. Anyway, so these are the three uh, class of modes pressure. The classes of modes are defined by what is the restoring. So the restoring force is pressure. Yeah. I uh, cut up the medium and it is restored by pressure. So then you call it a pressure mode. That's a sound wave. Okay. Yeah. So I want you to just imagine that depending on your horizontal wavelength, you found your cavity depth. In that cavity, now you can fit many, many modes which have radial node in the radial direction. This is like a radius R. Okay. Now I have found out the depth of my cavity for a given wavelength. There is a single wave. The turning radius will depend on the horizontal wavelength. But once you found your turning radius, I can fit many, many waves, just like I can fit in a given cavity many modes, which will have nodes like this as a function of radius. Okay. So it is a, that's why I said it's a very complicated data, but it is just like the data. Physical instruments. So that's what it is. P mode, you see, goes like that. G mode has a very complicated looking dispersion relation. After all, we tried to derive one dispersion relation today. This is also a problem where you should derive a dispersion relation. Let's see for yourself. How does the behavior of frequency with respect to K uh, look like? Sun supports a wide variety of things. P is one such, which is the most useful one because it is sensitive to the temperature, the sound. Um, yeah, temperature, sound speed like temperature. So if the mode is sensitive to the temperature, by observing the mode, you can tell about the temperature, right? Yeah. And because it is traveling inside the sun, it is sampling different layers of the sun. But it is coming back to the surface as part of the total internal reflection. Yeah. Why total internal reflection? Again, you just see, when you see a mirage, why does it happen? Just ask the same question, that is the same thing here. Answer the same. Okay. So, because of total internal reflection, where both samples flicker there, comes back to the surface, causes flicker noise on the surface. Okay, not the granulation noise. It's a different noise. It's more, uh, uh, yeah, it's more global uh, oscillation of the sun, and that can be observed. Okay, this is what the diagram, which is called the diagnostic K omega diagram, which are constructed where the ridges that you see, this is for example the F mode, here, this mode, parabola. Most of these look like a parabola, right? So this is a horizontal wavelength, 
This is a period of oscillation, typically a five minute uh, period of oscillation. <laughs> if I go and take a cut along this axis, all these little dots here that will come on that line, each of those dots are a single node. You go to the next level, count again so many nodes. Each one of those is a single mode of oscillation. Each one, each dot on the diagram is a single mode, is a global mode of oscillation. Okay. So, so it, but it is very powerful because if I just select my wavelength, I know that these particular at this cut, what is the depth at which they are returning from, and that is how I one by one by going to from here to this side, one by one I am sampling the depths of the sample. Okay. And these are the, so this is continuous in horizontal wave numbers and discrete in vertical wave numbers, just like here. These are discrete wave numbers in radial direction for a given cavity. Yeah. But in horizontal, that is continuous function. Okay. So there is no tracking there. Yeah, so that's the formula for that for a given L, L is your spherical harmonic is the L. We are talking in terms of Fourier wave k. Typically, k times the solar radius is about L. Okay. So, square root of L equal to this one is about k to the r sum. If you just put in these numbers, you will find what particular value of k corresponds to what is what the depth. So, as you see, the blue is the longest wave wavelength. It goes almost close to the center. The red ones are high wave numbers, small wavelengths. They are only sampling the near surface layers. Okay. Studying them, oscillating them like this, is a uh, helix point, essentially. Now, what are the dispersion relations for these three family of modes? So for some simplified settings, you can do G modes, which are, so today we looked at two uh, kinds of situations, right? One was a surface gravity, in which the lighter fluid was on top of the denser fluid, that was a stable situation. We saw as mode. Similarly, G mode is another type of gravity wave that exists in a stably stratified medium that is stably stratified, meaning the density decreases as a function of entropy increases as a function of You work out what is an entropy, what is a functional form of entropy in a plane parallel atmosphere. If your medium is isothermal, how does the entropy change as a function of height? So it's linearly increases. So that is what is, if entropy decreases, you'll find that the medium is unstable to convection. So the medium is, uh, can be in a hydrostatic medium to begin with, but it is unstable to convection. That's when convection occurs. So G modes is the opposite of convection. Okay. So in layer, outer layer where there is no uh, convection, where there is convection, there is no G mode inside. G mode lives in a stably stratified Okay. The example we, should, we saw was uh, today uh, isothermally stratified medium, the stable stratified. Okay. So G mode should be supported there. That's the frequency. As you can see, if the ds by dz is negative, this becomes imaginary and you will actually see convection. So criteria for convection is already here. The ds by dz must be negative. Okay. Opposite of G is convection. Opposite of surface gravity is regulated. Okay. T modes that uh, you have seen, this is uh, something uh, you have direct uh, sound speed, right? So, sound speed calibration you have done. Yeah. But you can do it's very simple calibration. You find that this is very simple. Omega C comes when there is a stratification. If you try to solve sound speed in a gravity, with gravitational thing, you get a factor here. But you can forget about it for now. It's a linear relation. That is basically omega square, typically going as c square kx square. That means omega by k, which is a phase speed, is sound speed. Omega by k does not depend on k. It's a non-dispersive effect. Whereas this omega by k goes in one over root. That's a dispersive wave. Meaning different wave numbers travel with different speed. Here, yeah. all wave numbers travel at the sound speed. Yeah. The restoring force for this is pressure, the restoring force for this is gravity. 
this is more interesting. Or traditionally, inner seismology uses or employs keyboards, sound boards, <coughs> because it is sensitive to the background thermodynamics. Sound speed yeah, encapsulates the background thermodynamics. So by studying these waves, one can actually infer the linear structure. By looking at this, people have largely ignored it, except for some very special regions. Because it only is sensitive to the surface gravity. It doesn't depend on anything else. Surface gravity is only sensitive to the mass of the object, right? So it doesn't teach you anything about the interior thing. Okay, so that's why it's largely ignored. G mode, on the other hand, exists only in a stable stratified medium. So it is trapped in the radiative core and is evanescent in the outer layer and has so far never been observed on the surface of the sun. But one is actively searching for G modes. That's a very active area of research. That if somehow one detects the G mode from the sun, one will be able to better constrain the very core of the sun. There is a large error bar today that can be all rectified if these G modes could be observed. But as you see the diagram, these waves turn back in the core. They don't come out. A, but it's just like a membrane. Like I uh, put my hand here. That's exactly what you're doing. You are only seeing this face. Yeah? And you are feeling something. And I uh, bang it here. You can feel it here. No? Not the sound, but you can also feel it here. So that's all is happening. So even if my this tab doesn't propagate through, yeah, the amplitude of that perturbation is exponentially decaying, but if this length is not very large, you will still feel because it will have some sort of a skin there. Okay. So if I tap it, this is the interior of the sun, this is what you are seeing, photosphere of the sun, and I am tapping something here continuously, and you are seeing some flicker. And if you can observe that, and which shows a spectrum like this, then you will conclude this as a G mode, then you are sure that, okay, this is coming from the much more deeper interior, then you will use that to study it. Okay. Now these were some of the simulations that I have run some time ago, which is, I take a cut from the sun, idealize it. This is like a surface, the mold line is surface. There is a medium below, there is a medium above. And the motivation to run some of these things were to see the response of magnetic fields that are below the surface on the F mode, which is typically ignored. As you see, the F mode doesn't seem to depend on magnetic field, but not so much. But then it turns out that I can just write it maybe a square, k square. That's a magnetic direction. Okay, that's also known <coughs> that if you put a horizontal magnetic field, suppose below the surface, I just put a horizontal magnetic field, I will get a linear contribution. This is linear because omega square going is k square, basically omega going is k, so that's linear. So this can be seen. But then I can try to see if different types of magnetic fields put in the sun, what are the impacts of those on the F mode, which we are routinely detecting, which is at the uh, 10 to zero. So just something, so what, how do you construct to there? In observation, how do you construct? So we have access to only the surface. So just imagine this is the surface, yeah? and you are measuring line of sight velocity component. That's your measurement in the data, which I can take from the simulation as uz. Z is in this direction. So uz is your line of sight velocity. If you're watching from above, uz is the line of sight velocity component. Yeah. And you are observing the sun. So I can take horizontal is this, make it one dimensional in horizontal. X, this is z, that's a box. There is also corona above. Yeah, but I'm only measuring it from here. Okay. There is a motion going up and down. That's the flicker that you are seeing all the time. That flicker will exist because there are modes trapped. Modes are trapped because of the boundary condition, which are impenetrable here and here. So modes will be trapped. And now I can play the same experiment that is done in observations. That I take the velocity field, which is vertical at this layer, which is line of sight, add the surface, which is z equal to zero, which is a function of time. Yeah, and a function of x. So at z is equal to 0, uz which is varying in time and x is your data. That is the data that is observed. 
to construct a diagram like that. That's an observational data here. Yeah. This is constructed from an observation. This is constructed from a simulation. Things look different for a good reason, but if you just focus on this mode, they don't look different. They are the same parabolic mode, basically this mode. Okay. <coughs> As promise was that we will look at these modes and try to say the condition of the object. Okay. So now I have a data which is use a as a function of x and g at z equal to 0, which is focused here. I can take a Fourier transform. Yeah. Fourier transform this data. What do I get? Fourier transform here. This x will give me kx. Yeah. And t will give me omega. Yeah. If I just take power spectrum, this will be a complex quantity. Right? If you take a Fourier transform, this becomes a complex quantity as a function of kx and omega. This is your dispersion relation, this is your power. If you plot power in a k omega diagram, that reveals the dispersion relation. Right? So if I take a square and call it a power p, yeah, that is the quantity that is plotted in color here. Okay. Color represents power, log of power. This is k, this is omega. If you are looking for a mode which we studied in the morning, omega square is equal to gk, that should form a parabola. So I can first just plot a parabola. This is a theoretical curve. This dash curve is a just a theoretical curve. Omega square is gk. Okay. And you see that there is a power or a ridge in the data. So that's how you identify that this is the f mode. Right? Now I can play a game, that's a non-magnetic classical f I can play a game that I impose horizontal one magnetic field and now compare this with this. See what you are observing is only this mode. Forget the rest, okay? Forget the rest and just focus on this because yeah, in the interest of time. So this became this. Okay, so now you can say that this is the fit, not a fit, but this is this uh, curve. That at high wave number, this part will dominate, this is a linear. At low wave number, this part will dominate, which is a parabola. And this is the field, this is the curve, which is that kind of a curve, GK plus. This is seen when I have imposed a horizontal magnet. Right? The power which was there at high wave number, smallness, has been diminished. So already by just looking at this mode, you are telling various things that there is most likely a horizontal magnetic field below the surface or above the surface. There is a horizontal magnetic field. You didn't uh, observe magnetic field at all. All you are doing is you are looking at a line of sight velocity, taking a power spectrum, making a plot in kx omega plane, and it so happened that you saw this and not this. This is an expected non-magnetic curve, and you saw this. What would be your conclusion? Okay, so there is seem to be a rhythm magnetic field which provides a tension in the fluid. So frequencies are larger compared to its non-magnetic value, larger frequencies. So just imagine a tightened mattress. Uh, you buy a new mattress, you jump on it, uh, it seems to produce bigger, uh, faster frequencies, right? When it becomes uh, soggy, old, uh, you uh, jump on it, you just uh, <laughs> sit on it. It will not uh, lead to uh, oscillation. So oscillation frequency already from a tightened mattress, you can see. You tighten the mattress, you uh, seem to jump uh, more easily. <laughs> okay, so that's some manifestation of the magnetic field that it provides tension to the fluid. So let's take tightening a matrix or a uh, uh, trampoline. <laughs> yeah. So that's one observation. At the same time, your vertical motion is suppressed because of the magnetic field because it's constrained. And therefore, the, there is a less power at high energy numbers, so the power is suppressed. So these are already two things that you learn without actually directly observing. It. That is the game that one plays in the assessment. Okay, let's quickly go over and finish it. Now I can put some more, more interesting magnetic things, which is more sunspot like, because now this is a game I wanted to play, and I put more like a bipolar sunspot and see what happens to the atmosphere. You see that what was a single value parabola has become fanned out. It's a very strong perturbation. 
Right now, with current telescopes, these wave numbers are not accessible, but that's a theoretical prediction. Okay? That if you observe these wave numbers, you will find that the line width, what is the line width? At a given wave number, I take a cut along the frequency to get a line. That's a Lorentzian type curve. Right? There is a no power here, why? Right? No power, no power, and suddenly there is a power. If you fit the line, you will find that this is a uh, Lorentzian type curve as a function of frequency at a given wave number. Right? That's a line. So, if I plot this, and that's my line, I can measure its line width, right? What I'm saying is that if this is in a classical case, but then if I put a different type of magnetic field, this line will get from there to there, very broad. It's a strong perturbation of the F mode. So F mode is sensitive to the changes in the magnetic field. If anything is sensitive to the changes you are making, that is what you want to know. How exactly it is sensitive? Then by looking at the change, you can comment on the property. In this case, the magnetic field, right? That is the use of So at this wave number four, if you sat here, you will find a narrow Lorentz wave. At the same four, in this case, which is different only in magnetic field, everything else is same in these two cases. We found that the line is so much broader. It's a box kind of a line. Okay. We uh, call it a fanning effect. F mode fanning. And you can play with it, you can put Gaussian, you can put various things. That's not the point. That point is the F mode seems to be sensitive to the uh, uh, magnetic field and therefore should be used. Even seismology has traditionally ignored magnetic fields. Now we are slowly beginning to uh, include magnetic field and call it magnetic field seismology. You can look up some of the old references to get directions of get new terms. This is derived in the morning. This is a magnetic field. F mode in simulation shows very good. Now I can put some sort of a different type of a field. Now this is a box again. That's a game. I'm essentially just it's like a toy and you play it. So this is the photos here we are observing from above. And this is the magnetic field that is below the surface. That means the red is a zero here. Red is zero. Okay. So if you are observing the sun. At this point, you would not have seen a magnetic field. Now, another question I want to ask is that, can I predict the emergence of activity? That is the, that has consequences for prediction and forecasting of the space weather, right? You want to, before the theory and players happen, you want to see if you can predict them already well in advance. Then, the way I would go is, by looking at the perturbations, possible perturbations of the F mode on the F mode by magnetic fields that are not yet detectable at the surface. These magnetic fields are only below the surface. So from for an outside observers, you don't see them yet. But I can see the F mode here. Right? So I want to see if there is any perturbation. And yes, there is. So all the black curves above, that is some measure of the strength of the F mode. Okay. This is still very controversial, this is going on. But because it's also like in the current telescopes, it's beyond the sensitivity limit. But hopefully in future, we will see that this will there are some fruit. The black curves, this is the strength of the F mode, which is nothing but you read off the power, you take the cut at each k and integrate the power below the curve, which is lower in the end, and that is the power of the F mode at a given wave number, right? Now, I can plot that as a function of various wave numbers and different, different magnetic fields, like this, like this. You see that in the classical case, no magnetic case, this drops rapidly as a function of wave number. But when I have a magnetic field, which is not manifested yet in terms of active region or sunspot, I see that the mode has strengthened. There is much more power in the F mode, which I can measure. That is a measurable one. So, if I just integrate that in K, I get a number which is this, which is at least four times larger than the number you get for classical case. So, already by looking at this strength of the F mode, 
I should be able to tell that there is a magnetic field very close to the surface. Why close? Because F mode is a surface gravity mode. Its eigen function is very, very shallow. It is not going deep. F mode is not going deep. It is lying on the skin of the surface. So if 700 megameter, if 700 megameter is the radius of the sun, F mode is lying very close to the surface here. Its eigen function does not go much deeper than, say, a layer mode 5 megameter. Okay. So outer 5 megameter is the layer in which the F mode exists. So surface gravity. It's at the interface, and interface is only here. And as you go deeper, uh, much deeper, uh, there is no sign of F mode. So when the magnetic field is close to the surface, we should be able to see some perturbation. So now, so these were the, all ideas which are very controversial. So this was the only instance when I did observations also, the observation history. So I just downloaded some data and tried to see. Now these are the observed P modes and F modes and everything. I do the same analysis. Isolate your F mode, fit a line, integrate below the curve, determine the power of the F mode at a given uh, wave number. And first look at a quiet sun. This is a magnetogram. This is a real observed magnetogram. That in a quiet phase, 2010 was the solar minimum. Nothing emerging around these states. And if I take a patch here and below, you don't see much. F mode seems to be symmetrically distributed in the quiet phase. That means if there is no magnetic field, this is only true for horizontal magnetic field, but for more complicated, the dispersion relation is not known. Okay, for general dispersion relation of F mode is unknown. It's very complicated. But this is my dash curve, okay, which is this curve. The dash black line is a theory curve that because surface gravity of the sun is known. And the ridge is the F mode, is an observed ridge. As you see that the theoretical calculation goes through the data, right? So there is no reason that in the quiet phase, if you measure the F mode power here or here or here or here, it should be the same, which is roughly the case here. That uh, this is the energy of the F mode as a function of time when there is no magnetic energy. Okay? Look at this, that this is the time when there is an active region. Before you even go into the detail, you see that the red and blue curves are very different. You bring in one active region, the F mode property changes. So the symmetry is broken by bringing an active region. So it's very powerful, right? I would consider it very powerful that as soon as you see some sort of symmetry, you would come in that, okay, maybe something is happening. Okay, so. This is the control patch. This is a patch where the active region is going to emerge. The zero is the time when it has emerged. About two days before, you see there is a peak in the F mode. How we were observing the uh, simulations. So this already has given a signal around this time when, from an observed data, there is nothing in this patch visible, right? Active region minus two days. That is the time when this patch is here. Sun is rotating, so two days later, this patch is here. So it is the same patch, but here two days later there is an activation, two days before there is nothing, but already at this time when there is nothing seen, you have seen some sort of a perturbation in the F mode. So that is what I meant by predicting in advance the emergence well. Two days is a very long time and it has huge implications, but that we will not discuss. So that's a proposal, but it is somewhat complicated because post emergence there is a lot of further secondary effects. So still actively working on this. This is a proposed method to isolate potential sites of active region formation. This is a proposed weather map. That you uh, keep producing such weather map. Whenever you see white is the brightest patch, but this part white is printed out. The data is of good quality only towards central meridian. Red is where it is going to emerge later. But already two days before, you see that here there is large values for the F mode energy. So if I have this uh, access to this weather map, I should be able to tell when something is going to happen. Thank you. Okay, so I think we can stop here. This is roughly the game one plays in Indian seismology. I just showed a very biased view of what I have done in Indian seismology. It's a very vast subject. I have used something which is quite non-traditional, F mode and magnetic field. Both are typically ignored in traditional Indian seismology. But for traditional things, uh, then you look up some of those things. Yeah?
Any question? So can you again explain So that is first you can just take an empirical point of view that I don't know physics there. Suppose yeah? that is how you start. And you say that uh, I measure the F mod at two different locations and find that within some error bar, somehow this plot doesn't have an error bar, the updated one does have an error bar. So within the error bar, whether I look at the north or the south, blue is from a southern hemisphere, red is from the northern hemisphere. So in two different hemispheres of the sun, small patch. This is the power of F mode measure from a very local patch. So it's called local helium size model. Local is more interesting because then you can tell what is going to happen locally in one side. Global has other values, but not for this purpose. So they are basically almost together. So you would say that the power of the F mode or the properties of the F mode are symmetric about the equator, or there is homogeneity. After all, it shouldn't matter where on the ocean or where on the sun you see. Roughly the behavior and property should be identical. Convection is roughly homogeneous in that uh, sense. Okay. So yeah, but now, but this is a time when there is no emergence on the sun. Now I go and find an isolated activation, which is quite hard. Quite often you have too many activations on the sun and they are polluting the data all the time. That is why uh, we are facing a lot of difficulty. But once in a while you get on the whole sun, only one, this is a small one, but only one is emerging. So now this is a good time to test if there is any effect that now the F mode in the north and south, are they still uh, same, the behavior of the F mode? And now you see that the symmetry is completely broken. The fact that this has an effect on the F mode is quite intriguing, quite surprising, that this is perturbed by magnetic. This itself was not known, basically, not long ago. Okay, so nice. If you need more questions, so we'll pick tomorrow. Uh, I'll see what I will cover tomorrow. I don't know yet. Is there any question from the online participants? No, I'm not that I can see, Michelle. Okay, so. Recording stopped. What do you have now? Is something else immediately or there is some break? <coughs> Is the speed today better or yesterday is better? Based on that, I will decide tomorrow. Okay? So, what do you prefer? Yesterday yes, yes, yes. today is too fast. Morning also is too fast. No. Oh. It was okay. Fine. Then I will uh, fix uh, tomorrow's thing. Okay.
Thank you. 